Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, St. John's Board of Trade event. Thank you all very much for joining. I'm Andrew Wadden. I'm the chair for uh, 2020. And we're very fortunate today to have uh, Minister of Health and Community Services with us, uh, Dr. John Hagee. And unfortunately, Dr. Fitzgerald uh, got hauled away uh, last moment to another commitment. But uh, Minister Hagee, of course, is a medical doctor, and we are still in the position to proceed. You all know Minister Hagee, he's uh, been a regular in our lives now for the past few months. And it's the work of Minister Hagee, our, our Chief Medical Officer, uh, Janice Fitzgerald, and Department of Health, and of course, cooperation from everybody in the province that has put us in a position where we have, uh, not just at this point, frankly, I suppose, flattened the curve, but uh, really crushed it for now. Uh, what I'll do right now is I'll just toss this over to uh, Minister Hagee and let him make some opening remarks and we'll go from there. Minister Hagee. Thanks very much, Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, uh, great to, to have the chance to, uh, to chat with you. Um, uh, again, just to repeat what Andrew said, um, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald had anticipated right up until around 9.30 this morning that she would be here and we'd been talking about uh, some of the questions that you'd submitted. Uh, unfortunately, she did get hauled away and uh, it wasn't anything to uh, uh, to do with her, as it were, and certainly it wasn't anything she'd, uh, she'd wished for. So uh, I'd like to just apologize for those of you who were sold one ticket and ended up with a slightly different one. Uh, so really and honestly, it's great to be here. I'm uh, happy to, to deal with your questions and uh, I've got a little bit of flexibility about the time at the end. So, Andrew, back to you, sir. All right. Thank you, Minister, very much. But folks, we'll get going. Um, some questions have been submitted previously by various members. We've got some questions we've done up ourselves. I should note that uh, if during the course of the uh, presentation or the questioning, you have some thoughts or questions, I believe you can send those uh, through the Zoom chat to Ashley. Please do that and she will get them to me. If we have time, we'll get to some of those as well. I also want to note that while you can't hear her or see her, our new CEO, M. Marie Boudreau is on the call and uh, she has jumped right in this week helping out getting this event going. I can tell you that you will hear from her and see her more in the coming weeks. So Dr. Hagee, we'll get going. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you about uh, is about the alert levels we have. You know, the government and indeed you and Dr. Fitzgerald have indicated that we might move back in alert levels should COVID-19 reemerge here in the province. We saw this weekend some cases popping up in PEI, and that's relevant to Newfoundlanders to the extent, I suppose, that the Atlantic bubble just sort of kicked off. I guess what we want to know is what would have to happen for us to move back to alert levels three or four or perhaps even five? Well, I mean, when that plan was drawn up, it was drawn up with the information that we had at the time. I think things have changed even uh, in the general environment in Canada since then. Uh, and so really and honestly, our concerns would be around several things that might feed into that. I don't think there'd be any one clear reason why you would, would jump back a complete level across the province. So um, essentially, it comes down to, very simply, uh, uh, the arrival of clusters of cases uh, scattered geographically uh, that we couldn't account for through travel and that posed a risk to the um, the resilience or the, uh, the capacity of the healthcare system, that would necessitate going back levels. I think what you might see as we do see cases from time to time, if we do get into a cluster situation, we may have a more focused or geographic response. We've seen that work in other jurisdictions. So, um, uh, you know, those kind of things are on the table too. Okay, or are you suggesting then, I wanna make sure I understood what you said correctly, that it's possible that the alert level we could go to could be different in various regions of the province? It depends on the situation, but we're not ruling that out. So for example, if you had a, a localized outbreak in Gander that was travel related, but was su sufficiently large that it put a little bit of a strain on the local healthcare resources, you might go backwards in the Gander area or in the central area uh, and yet not affect Metro, uh, vice versa. Uh, so I think it, it's going to be a matter of, of um, more judgment rather than less, well, this number is five, therefore we shut the province again. Go ahead. Minister, uh, a very hot topic at the moment and indeed for some time now has been uh, masks. And we know that they're not necessary outdoors. Uh, 
you know, when physical distancing is, is possible, not necessarily in your home or perhaps even while visiting friends, but evidence suggests, as we understand it, that people should wear a non-medical mask while in indoor public spaces. I suppose we just want to know, as for the benefit of our members and employers, do you recommend wearing masks in indoor public spaces or elsewhere? And if so, I mean, is that something that we should look to possibly mandating? Your best bet, your best defense against uh, COVID-19 is actual physical distancing. And, and you've noticed we've stopped talking so much about bubbles and extended bubbles and these kind of things. And Dr. Fitzgerald has replaced it with this discussion about people, space, time and place. So how many people, what kind of space you're all in, how tightly packed you might be, how long you're there uh, and so on. Uh, whether it's indoors or outdoors. There is no doubt that in circumstances where you cannot adequately physically distance, a non-medical mask is a benefit. But when you take the bigger context at the moment, as you said, we really don't have a curve. We've had a, a flat line of zeros for well, with one blip uh, pretty well two months. Uh, so um, uh, at the moment, the mandating piece, there isn't the case to be made to do that. Uh, should those numbers change, then obviously we could revisit that. But again, uh, if you can't physically distance uh, for the protection of other people, uh, then a non-medical mask is a good idea. Okay. Mr. Hagee, as part of regular health screening, employers are asking uh, for the most part that anyone feeling unwell or you know sick in any way not come to work. If an employee is not feeling well or is forced to go home sick, how long do you recommend that they stay out of the workplace? And should that employee get tested for COVID-19? You know, I suppose when it comes to how long they should stay out of the workplace, are we looking at the standard two weeks or is it shorter or longer? It's something employers just want a little more clarity on. Yeah, uh, it really depends on what's wrong with you. I mean, if you've got a tummy upset, we'd by and large not thinking COVID at the, at the beginning of that kind of thing. Uh, and in general, we would say stay home until your symptoms have been gone for 24 hours. If you have any of the symptoms uh, on the COVID list, and, and that's up on the website, but essentially is, you know, runny nose, a cough you can't explain, uh, fatigue, aches and pains, fever, these kind of things, uh, then ring 811. Uh, and, and you can get tested on the basis of that. So if you fall into that category, you should stay home, uh, self-isolating, until the results of that test are back. One of two things will happen. If you're negative, you go back down the first line and say, well, 24 hours after your symptoms are resolved, you can go back to work. If you're positive, uh, then you go down the COVID track, which is basically 14 days self-isolation, public health will follow up with you over that time to see how things are getting on uh, and uh, other things being equal at the end of 14 days your symptoms are likely to have resolved uh, with a mild case and you'd be eligible to go back to work under those circumstances but public health have a regime about that uh, about um, specific advice so it varies and, and that's a broad outline okay i was going to reserve any questions coming in from the from the viewers and the membership till the end, but there's one that's come in there that's sort of relevant to what we're discussing in the moment, so I'll, I'll run it by you now. Do you have any feelings or suggestions uh, for businesses around private COVID-19 testing? Um, there are no licensed tests uh, for um, diagnosis, excuse me, other than the ones we currently use through, uh, through the regional health authorities and the public health laboratory. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that that test is really a diagnostic test. And because of uh, the epidemiology of the disease, uh, it, it's actually very unreliable to use it as a screening test. So I think the challenge there is what the results actually mean. Uh, and it's very complicated in terms of statistics and how to explain it. And my wife forever keeps telling me off saying you're confusing people. But essentially, if the um, prior predictive probability of doing the test is low, then you are going to get a result that could be 5% false positive and 20% false negative. The concern from that point of view is that you might actually have people who test negative who subsequently develop the disease uh, and they go around thinking they're okay and everybody else does. Um, so 
we don't have a screening test that works other than 14 days self-isolation if you have symptoms. Mr. Hagee, travelers who enter Newfoundland and Labrador from outside of Atlantic Canada, uh, as I understand it, must submit an isolation plan. Right. Are there any other measures currently in place to monitor visitors? Yeah, or we, one we thing have yeah, we, we have a form uh, that has to be filled in and, and left behind. Uh, it consists of, you know, an acknowledgement by the individual that they have a responsibility to, to follow the isolation plan. Uh, they also have, um, uh, you know, ticked that they know where they can go for further information. But they have to leave a contact number. Uh, and uh, that contact number, uh, particularly if it's a cell phone, uh, is often used uh, at random to send texts to people. Uh, explaining how they can get further information or get tested if they do have symptoms. Uh, and it also allows um, public health at random to, to give them voice calls as well. So uh, there is, um, uh, in addition to simply the declaration, those, those other features. All right. Thank you. This is one I know that is on the minds of uh, a lot of our members. You know, the, the lockdown that we were forced into due to the pandemic, uh, certainly allowed us to flatten and indeed, for the moment, obliterate the curve. Many, however, particularly within the business community, would say that it has come with considerable social and economic consequences. If we find ourselves facing a second wave, are we better positioned to handle it now? I think the answer is yes. Uh, before, we had a, a, a very good public health uh, network uh, and public health staff. Now, those people are not only good, but they're practically experienced in a way that teaches you little tricks and nuances that you wouldn't otherwise have. But, um, you know, we have a kind of in-depth layered strategy. We look at border controls. We look at prevention, uh, again, with social distancing, sorry, physical distancing. Uh, masks under those conditions that we've described earlier on, good um, sneeze and cough etiquette, hand washing, these kind of things. One of the biggest successes we've had with this whole business is actually getting people to wash their hands. And we've seen a reduction in uh, flu-like illnesses uh, of all, all sorts, as well as the, the usual uh, run of virus uh, tummy upsets that you would see in, in facilities and across the province. Those have dropped off quite remarkably. So there's a prevention piece. The other thing is then ISA identification. We have one of the lowest thresholds for, uh, for testing through 811. Uh, and we have um, uh, yardsticks around contact tracing because the testing is great. You don't need to isolate the individual and then you need to trace their contacts. Um, the kind of national slash international standard for that is 60% within 48 hours. So you trace 60% of the contacts and have them tested within 48 hours. With our clusters, our numbers were 90% traced and tested within 48 hours. So we kind of lead the way uh, or certainly don't lag in that regard. And that capacity is there and there are reserve capacities that we looked at in terms of training additional folk for um, some of the contact tracing that can be done. Uh, and then uh, we have at the back end uh, some reserve because uh, between the provinces and territories, we've looked at keeping between 10 and 15 percent of our hospital beds available for um, for a COVID surge. That okay. comes as a challenge because that then reduces the amount of elective planned surgeries that you can do. Uh, but at the moment, there is no clear consensus on filling our beds up uh, completely with planned and elective procedures the way we used to. Uh, and so that decision process has been handed over to physicians and clinical chiefs to sort out who goes first and in what order. So. It's much more of an in-depth approach than simply a, a yes or no answer. And those figures around bed occupancy, for example, in terms of what you keep as reserve, uh, those are things we discuss on a regular basis at the federal, provincial and territorial levels to see what, which way that wind is blowing, to see if we can change and, uh, and provide a bit more capacity for the routine uh, planned procedures. But it's an open question at the moment and one we're checking. Okay. 
if I may, just continuing on for the moment with this theme of whether or not the province is better positioned to handle um, what we presume might be a second wave. You know, this weekend we saw, you know, on Water Street is a, is a great example, we saw businesses finally, I'll say, making hay while the sun almost shined. You know, a lot of businesses have put some money at their own expense into expanding their operations. Now that people can go enjoy a restaurant and things like that, we've got the pedestrian mall downtown. Just one example of one part of Newfoundland that is uh, reopening and working diligently to do it properly. But, you know, these business owners and, of course, the employees that work for them are concerned because they're wondering if the second wave comes, and let, let's assume it will, we're hoping that they won't have to take such drastic measures or be mandated to take such drastic measures. So I guess the question is, will we be able to combat a second wave without businesses having to take the drastic measures that they have in the past number of months? What do you think? No, and I mean, it, there certainly has been an economic price to be paid. And I think given the uncertainties of March and early April uh, at the time, uh, that was a, a judgment call. Uh, and, you know, half the population think we were right and half the population think we were wrong. So we probably landed in a reasonable place at that point. Going forward, I think uh, we would love to try and do the least we have to to safely contain any second wave. There is a significant debate about the, the nature and timing of a second wave. Uh, and our own um, analytics group here are actually struggling because with zero as your yardstick, it's actually very difficult to model anything under those circumstances. So they've had to lean on the Public Health Agency of Canada, which looks at the uh, provincial territorial trends across the country. Uh, and there does still seem to be a wave or a wavelet destined to arrive here sometime in the fall. So I think um, having said that the fact it's coming, the fact that we have a fairly robust system available to us at the moment we know a little bit more about the disease than we did before, it may well be possible to craft solutions which don't appear as restrictive uh, or, or inhibit normal, as it were, life, if you can use the word again, um, in the way that our previous lockdown did. Um, we need to live with COVID. Uh, people talk about, you know, well, we'll wait till it's over. You can't. You don't know when it's going to be over. There is no certainty that a vaccine that's produced on the basis of this virus will still work in the fall or next year. So we have to have a plan for life with COVID. And that in broad brush was what we released earlier when we had our alert system. Uh, and it's similar to a lot of plans across the world, not just in Canada. Okay. So is it possible then, and I'll leave this and go to another topic in a moment. Is it possible then that uh, perhaps a, the restrictions that would be put in place could be, uh, while restrictive, uh, perhaps less restrictive, yet still adequate. For, like, for example, something that would uh, ensure that we are protecting our elderly, others that are uh, more vulnerable to, uh, to, this type of, to this type of virus, while still letting those people in the population who might be able to tolerate it a little better uh, to go about their daily lives. Is that something that the department is playing with and possibly looking at? Yes, I mean, there's a big debate, for example, with the, the advent of, you know, the school year. It's not that far away. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion around how you open schools uh, and do that in a way that makes sense. And that's one population. Uh, people have conflated, uh, and it's understandable, but it's actually artificial the association between opening the borders and travel uh, and visitation in long-term care and acute care facilities because you're dealing with two different populations whose level of risk tolerance is completely different uh, and the hardest for us both in doing it and now in managing people's expectations is around the visitation in long-term care because we know the dire results if the virus should get into a long-term care or a personal care home. So um, I think we need to segregate a little bit where possible. Um, and, and as long as our public health and our acute care facilities resources can match the challenge that COVID might produce, then we're on reasonable ground. And if that means having different rules for different groups, 
we're not averse to that at all. Okay. I just want to talk for a second, if we can, um, about the bubble, the Atlantic bubble that we've started. And indeed, advice uh, from the experts in Newfoundland seem to be that it is that we, as long as we have our reliance and on science, it's been the safe thing to do. We've seen uh, similar comments from epidemiologists out of uh, Dalhousie, Nova Scotia. But of course, things things can change day to day, and we've seen how quickly a, a one case can turn into many more. Is the province prepared to, if necessary, uh, and in, in the interest of the safety of people and, and businesses, uh, retract the bubble uh, at any at any given time if needed? I think the discussions around the bubble have, have included things like that. What happens if, if the bubble pops, for want of another analogy? Um, and, and I think people are aware of that possibility and are um, uh, equipped, I think, with some of the other manoeuvres that they've done before. So, I mean, the, the difference between the Atlantic bubble now and what we did two weeks ago simply uh, it, it, it alters the criteria for people coming in from uh, the other three provinces. That could be reversed with little um, operational difficulty. Um, the challenge we've had with um, interprovincial travel, quite frankly, is that the, uh, the bodies responsible for it, so principally Air Canada and Marine Atlantic, mm. uh, do, not, um, uh, do not fall under provincial jurisdiction. They fall under federal jurisdiction. Uh, and their view, quite clearly, um, on the one hand, has been, we are in the business of selling seats to move people. And so the other pieces around it in terms of uh, what we do when people arrive here, we've had to craft in the same way Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and PEI have done. And if you look back before the bubble, each of those provinces had broadly similar uh, restrictions on their borders. It was residents only, um, uh, New Brunswick were turning around 35, 40 vehicles a day uh, at the border. It was very easy for them to do because it was a road. You just pulled them off and turned them around. Here it was a ferry ride or an airplane ride. And we have sent folk back as recently as last week. But we have to do it in a slightly different way because often the nature of transportation means they have to stay overnight. Uh, but uh, the Atlantic bubble is a, is a toe in the water. Uh, and if we get burnt, then we'll have to think again. Okay. You know, the, the hope of the business community, of course, is that, and it is not just the business community, but everyone, is that, you know, business and COVID-19 can coexist successfully, simultaneously. At the risk of, you know, repeating some of the obvious things that we know about, I suppose, Minister Haggy, right now at a time when businesses are really, really digging into the reopening, do you have any sound advice about uh, creating safe spaces because there's some look you know you can type this question into google and gosh knows how much information you'll get back some but right some but wrong uh, i and, and the business community would love to hear it directly from you you know whether it be a restaurant or a store in the mall what are the main and best things they can do to make sure that they're doing the best they can do uh, to keep their customers and their employees safe the, there are guidelines out there and the business response team was set up to try and help that. It was done on the basis that um, we, public health, health and community services, we're not business people in that sense. We don't know what it takes to run a good restaurant or a successful uh, food business or, or um, a tourist related activity. The people who know that are the ones who do it. So the idea was that, you know, various organizations, representative organizations, such as Hospitality Newfoundland and Labrador, would submit uh, plans based on the guidelines that were out there for um, a scrutiny or a, a, a once over from public health. Uh, and I think we have uh, a fairly conservative medical officer of health in that regard. And so those recommendations that are out there are your yardstick really. Uh, and they all go back to the same principle. Uh, it's good hygiene, uh, good sanitation, it's um, physical distancing. Uh, I mean, you, you go to JAG and you look at their idea about putting the mannequins at the table, an right. inventive way of making the place look busy, uh, but yet actually physically distancing people. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the average reservation size is at a restaurant, but again, uh, uh, one would hope 
that people would uh, appreciate the fact that, you know, that, that extended social circle uh, and that the six, however you like to classify it, would be the focus for those kind of activities. Um, so again, there is no secret source for this. Uh, and, uh, you know, people just have to acknowledge that we all have a role to play, whether it's as a customer, uh, a passerby, uh, or a, a restaurateur, you know, uh, we each have to try and do our bit. And I think uh, cumulatively, that that will yield the best bang for your buck in the end. But there is a way, I think, where business, recreation, and the virus can coexist in a way that, uh, that makes life nearer uh, than normal we used to have. Dr. Hagee, I know we're, we're at our time here. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like, to, I'm looking at some of the questions that have come in from members. I'd like to uh, at least try and get to one or two of them, if that's all right with you. No, sure, we, 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 can, we can do a couple more. I mean, uh, as I say, I have a little bit of flexibility, but not an infinite one. So uh, I, I'm conscious that it was a fairly, a fairly short affair. So fire away. Okay, thanks very much. I'll, I'll read this directly out. It says that some of those in our province that have had COVID-19 have been contacted for blood testing to see if they have antibodies uh, slash immunity. Are all of those people being tested or is there only a specific age group being tested within those patients? And how is this testing being used for research? Well, there's two things there. Um, currently, uh, Canadian Blood Services are taking the lead on this in St. John's and they have on their webpage uh, the criteria there from memory. I think you've got to be under 67. You've got to be um, tested negative, having tested positive before, and I think there's a 30-day wait uh, for the antibodies to develop properly, and then they're being used for two purposes. One is to test the antibody test, because we don't actually have a gold standard for that yet, and the second thing is then to, to have a list of people for whom uh, convalescent plasma uh, may be available for donation later on for treatment. There is um, a, a mixed messaging in the medical community about how effective uh, um, convalescent plasma might be uh, and that jury is out but we are part of a multi-center trial so if people in, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador were to be found to be severely ill with COVID um, they would be entered into if eligible a trial and we could use local convalescent plasma donors to try and treat them uh, and that was set up by the uh, academics at Memorial fairly early on when there was a call for interest. So um, that's kind of the background for that. Uh, it's, it's research, literally, uh, and we're in it. I'm going to ask, a, I see another question came in from a member on a couple of occasions, so I'm, I'm going to ask you this. I think I probably know the answer, but I'd like to hear your views on it. You know, obviously we've had an extended period of uh, Fortunately, an extended period of zero cases here in the province. The question is, why doesn't the province acknowledge uh, that there's no COVID-19 here as was done uh, in New Zealand and uh, perhaps live, allow people to live life as they normally would have prior to COVID-19? Because you, you know, from a point of view of intellectual honesty, you can't actually say that. All you can say is we have no knowledge of any COVID being here. Um, because, as I said earlier, there is no screening test. Uh, if, there, if the virus is here, uh, it's certainly very scattered. The, the, the facts of the case are, though, um, I worry about a sense of complacency at a time when, particularly now, you see an accelerated desire to return. Uh, I think, unfortunately, to return to the way life was last July, because really and honestly, for the foreseeable short term, and probably for the foreseeable medium term, that is really not a feasible goal. We went through COVID and the lockdown to get us to a stage where we could open up. It wasn't the castaway and Tom Hanks to hide away for seven years or whatever it is, uh, because right. you can't really do that. Um, so I, I think uh, we just have to bear that in mind uh, with, with what happens next. And I think language is key. Um, I don't think from an intellectual honesty point of view, you could actually make that statement. I know it's been made, and right. then you look and see what happened to New Zealand afterwards. They put the military in charge of testing at the airports or screening. Right, okay. Well, Dr. Hagee, we're a little past our time now. I know you had some flexibility. 
I suppose what I just want to say uh, to you, uh, one is thank you very much to you and your department and our chief medical officer for all the time that you've put in. Obviously, the time extends well beyond the time we see you on TV or hear you on the radio every day. I suspect you've been uh, working the long hours and sharing the stress that many of our business community uh, has been under for the past number of months. The only request I had, again, on behalf of our membership and on behalf of the business community, is that if and when, and I suppose it's really a matter of when, Minister Hagee, uh, the new wave comes, that the government and your department just consider uh, restrictions, albeit restrictions that are uh, perhaps not as stringent as the, one, as the ones already put in place and will allow businesses uh, to continue to operate as safely uh, as possible. Uh, I'd like to leave you uh, with the last word. If you have any final comments you'd like to make uh, to the membership on the call. No, I mean, your, your, your group and, and the Chambers of Commerce across the island represent the, one of the bigger economic engines of, of the province. And it's a key piece of survivability and sustainability. Uh, I think we've learned a lot uh, and certainly I think that there is a way where businesses can, just like the rest of us, live with COVID-19 uh, and happy to have those conversations as and when. Hopefully they won't be needed, but as and when. Um, I'd just like to thank your members for taking time out of their busy day uh, and hope uh, the discussion was, uh, uh, was of interest and of some use. Uh, the door is always open, though, uh, Andrew, if you, on behalf of your organization, uh, feel you need something else, then uh, feel free to, to contact me. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to uh, all our staff, the Board of Trade, who uh, were able to set up this call. Thank you very much to the membership for watching, and, of course, this will be available on our Facebook page uh, later today, I believe, for anybody who didn't have an opportunity, rather, to watch it live. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Hagee. We certainly will be talking again soon, and all the best to you. Thank you very much. Have a good day, folks. Bye-bye.